Coming up on Judge Rinder's Crime Stories. Trapped in a burning building, five family members fight for their lives. Liam tried so hard to break that window that every time he threw something at it, it came back at him. The suffocating heat, the terror, the absolute knowledge that this is potentially the end of your life. It's just incomprehensible. All I remember shouting was my kids were stuck in there. I just had to watch and wait. Very painful. And later, the family fear the worst. Christmas night, they found our car with a handbag in it. And at that point, I looked at my dad and said, Mom's dead. It broke Lorraine. She just collapsed. We then realised that the police were looking for a body. Disputes between neighbours are a common occurrence. In this case, the shocking lengths a neighbour went to left an entire family devastated. The Shires family were well loved in their local community of Prestatyn, North Wales. There was five of us, and I was the eldest of all of us. We moved from place to place a little bit when we were really young, and then we moved to North Wales when Things changed massively for us. We got a nice big house and just settled down. We never had money, and we still don't have money. But we had the family, and, and that's where your love comes from. After having two sons, Mum Joy had been thrilled when her first daughter, Liana, was born. She was only little, eight pound five. Came out the same day, we went shopping straight away, because she was so lovely. She was very bubbly and she's very joyful. You could have a good laugh with her. Uh, she was uh, she was Joy's best friend. They were inseparable. They were like sisters. Anna looked a lot like Mum. They were always together, them two. Always bouncing off each other as well. A lot of fun. Liana was soon joined by her younger brother, Michael, and the family were complete by the arrival of little sister, Sylvia. We'd always be together, no matter what we did. If it was meeting up for a coffee, going for a meal, Whoever saw us knew that we were coming because you'd never be without each other. We were close, really close. It was a nice family at the end. And as the children got older, the family grew. I met a girl. We ended up having Bailey. Uh, so Bailey was, was the first grandchild. It was amazing. When he was first born, I didn't put him down. He came everywhere with me. I mean, it's a lovely, lovely experience. Daughter Sky soon followed. She really was a character. She was her mum all over. She looked like me, but she had her mum's attitude. Everything was her way. Beautiful little girl. Sky and Bailey were inseparable. They were always together, always had fun, always up to mischief together, and such loving children. When Leanna met boyfriend Liam Timbrell in her late teens, it was her turn to settle down. He was a little bit different to somebody that Leanna would have been with. She was, at the time, a gothic type of girl, uh, but uh, he wasn't. He was very quiet, very timid, very little. He was, he was very short, uh, but they, they hit it off and he, he adored my sister. He was lovely to her, he adored her. You could tell her from the get-go. And I think, together, they created just a lovely atmosphere to be around. And before too long, there was another new addition to the Shires clan, when Liana gave birth to son, Charlie. We used to help her with Charlie, me and Pete and Sylvie would all help her. We was all very close together. He was my angel. He was very lovable and I used to go out and buy special cherries for him. He loved the cherries and sweets and things like that. He was, he was my soul. He was a very cheeky little boy, very happy little boy. It was very rare you would find him being sad. I thought Anna was too young to have a family, but they stepped up to the mark and they both looked after him. Liam worked two jobs to look after Anna and Charlie. He was a good man. Soon after Charlie's birth, Liana was thrilled when she and Liam got a place of their own. She was excited for that life and I think it was healthy for it. It was a next step for them as a family. They lived in Prestatin still but a bit further up from where we were living. And it was a house on top of a flat, a masonette. 
The downstairs woman lived with a gentleman, and then up the stairs where my sister was with Liam and Charlie, and obviously they had the, the third floor as well. She definitely made it so when you walked through the door, you felt like you were at home. Their neighbor was a lady named Melanie Smith. She lived with her boyfriend in the flat below the couple's masonette. At first, Anna used to get on with her. They used to have a fag together downstairs. She used to talk to her about Charlie, and then all of a sudden, she took a dislike to Anna. Melanie Smith was growing angry with Eliana leaving Charlie's push chair in a downstairs communal hallway. There was enough room for her to get in and out, but she, she's made it sound like there wasn't, and she took a dislike to the push chair. Melanie's anger escalated, and soon she was making threats. She used to say to Anna that she was going to burn the house down. And I would go, was she drunk? And she'll go, yeah. And I go, oh, ignore her. People don't mean what they say when they've had a drink. She's pretty well known um, for her behavior all around town. She was a uh, drunk and um, used to go around uh, threatening people, bullying people. With no reason to believe that Melanie would follow through with her drunken ramblings, on the 19th of October, 2012, Leanna invited her young niece and nephew to stay. Anna had a cooker fixed, so Anna offered to have them. They'd been there many times before, had dinners there many times, spent evenings there, but she said, can they stay? So we said, yeah, absolutely. When I got there, the kids jumped out of the car and they ran to the door. Liam was banging on the window, waving down. They were waving back up, and then I had to shout them back to get the kisses off them, which they both did. But they couldn't wait to get in. They couldn't wait. But just a few hours later, Leanna made a frantic phone call. At two minutes past 10 o'clock, I got that call. Dad, there's a fire downstairs. We need to get out. Can you help us? I'll never forget that. When we got there, the house was just up in flames. I tried the back, I tried the front. All you could just see was the smoke and flames. It was, it was horrible. We were there before the fire brigade, but we couldn't get in. The fire's too bad. We're standing there, shouting for them. But you've frozen to the spot. Melanie Smith was safe on the street outside. Boss Liana, Liam, and the three children were now trapped inside the burning building. Liam tried so hard to break that window. That every time he threw something at it, it came back at him. He tried so hard. He even told the operator when he rang them up. He told them we're gonna die. Can't get out, we're gonna die. That is gonna be so awful. You can't even begin to imagine what it would be like being trapped upstairs with young children, knowing that there's no escape, feeling the heat and the intensity, wanting to protect the people that you love and not being able to. The suffocating heat, the terror, the absolute knowledge that this is potentially the end of your life. It's just incomprehensible. It's the stuff of horror movies. I was just working and my phone rang and it was my dad. I still remember the exact time. It was, it was 11 minutes past 10. He phoned me uh, in a blind panic. He was shouting, he was screaming, uh, but I couldn't understand the words. I couldn't understand if it was fire or fight. I just ran, I just ran to my car and I just drove to my sister's as quick as I could get there. When I got there, I ran down the street. As I got to the corner, Liam had already been rescued from the fire and he was on the floor. The fire brigade managed to break the window and they get Liam out first. In fact, really he's still alive. Steve's two children, Bailey and Skye, were still trapped inside with Leanna and Charlie. 
All I remember shouting was my kids were stuck in there. And then I had to stand with my mum, my dad and my sister. And I just had to watch and wait. Very painful. <sighs> very, very, very hard. They rescued Bailey first. I recognised him from his pyjamas. Then they rescued Skye. And then they brought Liana out, but she was already gone. She had a tear, just one tear rolling down her face. And I was begging her to wake up. Please wake up. Wake up for mommy. Please wake up. And you know she's not gonna, but you can't help it. You want them so much to wake up. Then they had to go back in to find Charlie. Eventually they find him. And I had to go in the ambulance with him. Tragically, Leanna had died at the scene. Son Charlie and partner Liam had been rushed to hospital. So too had Skye and Bailey. When I got to the hospital, they were working on them both. They were trying everything they could. But it was too late. <sighs> A few days later, Charlie also lost his fight. It was too much for him. So I told him he could go. I told him Mummy was waiting for him. You can't believe it's true. How can it happen to us? How? What have we done to deserve it? But it did happen. Coming up, the truth is revealed. Liam managed to tell him who'd done it, and then he never spoke again. The superintendent came round to the house, and he explained to us that this person has been arrested. But will justice be served? Well, they were out for 15 hours, and the longer a jury are out for, you kind of start to think, are they doubting that she's done it? So that's when the nerves start kicking in. Twenty-three-year-old Liam Timbrell was now the only survivor of a fire that had swept his masonette, killing his partner, Leanna Shires, their 15-month-old son, Charlie, and Leanna's young nephew and niece, Bailey and Skye. Neighbour Melanie Smith had been threatening the family for weeks, but had she gone as far to start the blaze, the truth was about to emerge. With Liam the only one still clinging to life, the family were trying to come to terms with their loss, as the outside world had been learning more of the tragedy. Daily Post journalist Kelly Williams covered the story. Everybody in the newsroom is just absolutely shocked and devastated. The news just sent shockwaves throughout the community. There was a massive outpouring of grief for the family. Going to the scene, it was just the most devastating thing to ever be faced with. The house, you could see how badly damaged it was. It was just black from the ground floor right way up. When we got given photographs of inside, they're the most devastating photographs you will ever see. Absolutely heartbreaking. Everybody was speculating as to how it had happened. News was already circulating that the police had made an arrest. Word started to spread about the town and everybody just knew it was Melanie Smith. The superintendent came round to the house and he explained to us that this person had been arrested, but they had to get other evidence. So whilst they were doing that, they bailed her. Liam himself had already provided key evidence during his rescue. When Liam was brought out, he took his oxygen mask off his face and just told the rescue crews it was Mel, Mel did it. Liam never spoke again. He knew what happened to his family. He didn't want to live after that. Sadly, a few weeks after the fire, Liam lost his fight 
and with the police satisfied they could prove her guilt, Melanie Smith was charged with five counts of murder. She pleaded not guilty. The problem is that when you deny your involvement, it goes to trial and everybody has to listen to what happened during that crime. You're making the families of the victims relive it moment by moment. But she had so little consideration and conscience for their feelings that if she can protect herself and put them through that, well, that feels more positive for her than allowing people to see that she was indeed guilty. The trial was held six months later at Mould Crown Court. There was a lot of interest in the case, so as a reporter, I live tweeted the whole thing every day. I was getting a lot of interaction on Twitter from a lot of people who were keen to find out any detail about what happened because at this point nobody really knew. It soon emerged that Melanie had a history of making threats of arson, dating back as far as 2007. It seemed that anybody who crossed her, she wanted to get revenge and it was always fire that she used as a threat. She'd gone to a loved rival's house and left matches outside the porch as some sort of symbol. In the period leading up to the fire, it appeared that Melanie's escalating anger was largely down to the belief that her partner was cheating. She was out for revenge, she was very bitter. She was very twisted with rage, so she was just boiling up. The petty annoyances with Liana were pushing Melanie to tipping point. And on the night of the 19th of October, Melanie finally snapped. She had been drinking. She'd gone to the nearby takeaway and bought herself some food. She must have just felt really depressed and, and lonely and angry and bitter. She actually shouted through the letterbox, I'm going to set fire to your flat. But they obviously just ignored her. She'd done that before in the past. But the final straw came. She could just hear that they were having fun and decided that she wasn't going to let that happen. So she set fire to the pram, which quickly engulfed into flames. It set fire to the nearby power box and just plunged them upstairs into darkness. Using a lighter, Melanie had set fire to the pram, the object of her rage. Anna didn't have an escape route for the simple reason that the push chair was lit in front of her front door. There was no back door because she lived upstairs. There was no fire escape. Meanwhile, Melanie Smith had escaped, virtually unscathed. She was actually seen sitting on the curb with a blanket around her, and all she could talk about was insurance and her father's furniture. She was just devoid of any emotion at all, and, in fact, tried to play herself out as the victim rather than the perpetrator. Melanie continued this stance when she took to the stand. When it was time for her to give evidence, everyone was quite keen to hear how she was going to come across because she'd sat in the dock with her lip curled as if she was the victim, as if, how could anyone say I would do this? And then when she sat in the dock and we first heard her speak, her voice was just like a whining, petulant child who, who everyone was making up lies about. We heard evidence from so many witnesses and she tried to make out the 21 of those witnesses were just making up stories and lying about her. The barrister was asking more and asking more, and then she just snapped, and she started shouting. She was swearing, but she just denied everything. Never gave us any answers. <laughs> gave us nothing. After a three-week trial, it was time for the jury to make their deliberations. They were out for 15 hours, and the longer a jury are out for, you kind of start to think, are they doubting that she's done it? Are they considering a lesser charge? Because I became personally attached to the case and personally attached to the family, and I wanted more than anything for them to get that justice that they deserved. So that's when the nerves start kicking in. Melanie Smith was found guilty of five counts of murder and received a life sentence with a minimum of 30 years. Fire is absolutely destructive, and the results are diabolical, and that's reflected in the sentences that are given. The fact that she chose to set fire to the pram shows that she didn't really care about the consequences. You can't control fire, and the chances are that it's going to cause massive harm. Melanie Smith cried, but she cried for herself. She didn't express any sorrow. She didn't look regretful at all that she'd killed those people and babies. She just wanted people to feel sorry for her, and it was her bad luck that she was going to prison. Part of me was relieved to know that she was going to get the justice that came. I think that gave me comfort to know that 
When you walk down the street, she's off it. But this wasn't the end of the legal drama. One other person was to be held partly accountable for the deaths that night. Not long after Melanie Smith was arrested, we had also heard that the landlord had been arrested on suspicion of manslaughter. I always think this case is very, very unusual for the fact that he was also a retained firefighter who was the first on the scene when the fire broke out. He carried two of the children out of that property, but he also owned the property. It was discovered that despite being a firefighter, Leanna and Liam's landlord had failed to put the correct fire safety measures in place. The charge was dropped to a lesser charge of failing to provide adequate safety measures for the property. So we heard then that if he'd have installed a £250 fire door, it would have afforded the family an extra 30 minutes resistance to get out of that fire. And also he was criticised for the windows that were in the property as well. We do not blame the landlord himself. He did not commit the crime. But there again, he should have made it possible that there should have been access to, uh, for, for the people to get in and to get out some way. The windows, they wouldn't even open properly. Being a fireman, he should have known this all in the first place. The landlord received a sentence of 15 months, and now the family want to raise awareness about fire safety. We couldn't save Anna and the kids and Liam, but if we can save someone else, then we've done a good job. You should know your escape routes, even if you think, oh, it went up to me. I don't need to know, it's not going to happen. You do need to know, because you never know what will happen. Never. If you throw things at double glaze with it, all it does is come back at you and hit you. You have to break it in the corner of a, of a double glaze window, and it just shatters it. Melanie Smith's actions mean life for the Shires family will never be the same. Alan's my first daughter. That piece is missing, and it's never going to be filled doesn't get any better. You just live with it. You gotta get up every day and you gotta breathe every day. Even if you don't wanna, you gotta. We've had to fight to rebuild what we've got, to still half a part of us that's destroyed. It'll just never be the same. Miss every single one of them. All that fun and that joy we used to have. We've got some more beautiful children. The kids know about Bailey and Sky, all the pictures we've got of them. You see the smiles that they have? That's barely the sky. Incredible. Even through all what we've been through, we still manage to smile and we still manage to have fun. Even though we've been through all this, we still get to do that. 47% of all fires attended by the fire and rescue services in England are classed as deliberate. And since 2014, incidents of arson have risen by 11%. Make sure you know how to be safe if a fire takes hold. Plan your escape routes. Stay low to the floor to avoid smoke. Keep window keys near to the windows or purchase a fire safety emergency hammer. The brave family of Liana, Liam, Charlie, Skye and Bailey urge you to take precautions and make your home fire safe. Coming up, a son becomes a prime suspect after his mother goes missing. He said, oh, she stormed out the house last night. Me and her had an argument. If you had an argument, Mum, it was get out my house. So for him to say that the alarm bells for me just started ringing. They'd be telling a lie if I didn't instantly think he'd done something. We all did. Often there's a special bond between mothers and their sons. Sometimes that relationship can become so close that it ends up being toxic. This is the case of Carol Taggart. On December the 23rd, 2014 in Dunfermline in Fife, Scotland, 30-year-old Ross Taggart made a 999 call to the police. Friend, you are here? Uh, there's about one o'clock in the morning. Has there been any argument? Or... That's the thing. We had an argument. Uh, she's been a bit depressive and she even told the doctor that she didn't want to be here anymore. Ross was reporting the disappearance of his 54-year-old mother, Carol Taggart, explaining that she'd stormed out of the house they shared, from which she also ran a children's nursery business. That same day, Ross contacted his estranged sister, Lorraine, 
and her husband, Stephen. I saw on my phone that I had two missed calls from Ross. It's like, what's he phoning me for? Because we hadn't actually spoke to him for about six months. Stephen phoned him back and he said, Mum's missing, have you seen her? He said, oh, she stormed out the house last night. Me and her had an argument. But Ross's story didn't seem to add up. You had an argument, Mum, it was get out my house, and that just how it was. So for him to say that the alarm bells for me just started ringing. I'd be telling a lie if I didn't instantly think he'd done something. We all did. The family were indeed right to be suspicious of Ross, as Carol was dead. Killed at the hands of her own son in the early hours of the previous morning, and dumped in a hiding place, the location of which only he knew. Now Ross was at the start of an elaborate web of lies to cover up the crime he'd committed. But what had led Ross to kill his own mother and to destroy this once happy family? Ross was only young when Mum Carol and stepdad Sean embarked on a relationship. I brought Ross up if he was 18 months old. If that doesn't make him, minds I don't know what does. I did all the dad stuff, running at the back of the bike when the stabilizers come up. Sean had instantly fallen for Carol after they'd met on a blind date. I liked her because she was confident, strong-willed, knew what she wanted, and uh, she was a good laugh as well, a really good laugh. We hit it off right away. And 18 months after they met, the couple were overjoyed when daughter Lorraine was born to add to their brood. Carol was ecstatic. All she'd ever wanted was a wee girl because it allowed her to do all that pink, lacy bows and stuff. My cup of tea. She loved being a mum, loved having a little girl. We were just close, really, really close. Growing up, I danced up and down the country. And it was generally just me and my mum. She was always backstage, helping. She made costumes for me, done my makeup. Lorraine and her older brother, Ross, had a good relationship. He used to come to competitions sometimes and support me, even when we were little. Barbie and action men were out playing. We went a nice holiday every year, had a, a good car, did loads of stuff. It was nice, it was good. Sadly, the good times did not last. Ross started working when he was 15. He would be in a job for a while and then he would lose a job. We would get all kinds of excuses. It wasn't until we started looking closer at what Ross was doing, we were realising he was losing his jobs because he was stealing from them. I was challenging him on a regular basis, but it was causing a lot of friction between him and his mum because his mum was sticking up for him. Eventually, Ross's behaviour took its toll on Carol and Sean's relationship. It slowly degenerated into a Ross entirely coming between us as a couple. It was Carol on one side, me on the other, and Ross right in the middle. Eventually, that, that is what led to splitting up. For me, it was hard. A lot of the arguments were because of Ross, so I had a lot of bitterness feeling towards him because he separated my family as I felt it. Following the split, Lorraine and Ross's relationship also started to break down. How he spoke to my mum, I didn't like. She just took it. I watched him out and about clubbing, the way he treated women, womanizer, I didn't agree with that. And we had a lot of disagreements on that. Our relationship went downhill from there. And Lorraine's new boyfriend, Stephen, seemed to share her views on Ross. I'll not lie, I instantly took a dislike to him. He wasn't for me, he was just very arrogant and very opinionated. Carol did everything to please him. He asked for something that was yes, no problem. She always stuck up for Ross, and I just couldn't live my life like that anymore. Six months of me and Stephen dating, I had moved out. So it was only her and Ross left in the house. She did not want to be on her own. That was her biggest fear. So she clinged on to him. Ross seemed to relish having his mum all to himself. I think the fact that he was last man standing gave him this power over her, and boy, did he use it to his own benefit. He plodded along and sponged off her, so it was a sad state of affairs. He knew exactly what he was doing. Not long after she moved out, Lorraine's own relationship with her mum started to break down. Ross was jealous. If Lorraine ever went out with Carol, Ross had something to say about it, or had to tag along. 
If they went to the cinema, he had to go. His mum had to pay for it. His jealousy just grew from there. So he started to make up things. Lorraine said this, so my mum, Lorraine's been saying that. And I think he said it that much that Carla started to believe it. Ross got in our head and he knew how to manipulate her into feeling even lower than low. With Lorraine, it was really hard for her because the relationship with her mum was starting to break down because he was filling her head with so much nonsense. But he must have been telling her along the lines of you're losing her because she's moved out now. So her mum started getting quite nasty and vindictive towards Lorraine. And I think that was his plan. And he got what he wanted at that point, and his mum to himself. Carol had long suffered with mental health problems, and the family believed Ross could now even be using this to his advantage. My mum's dealt with depression ever since I was born, so it's always been there or thereabouts. I just felt that he abused that. He'd got his mum exactly where he wanted her, and he'd managed to alienate myself, Lorraine, and alienate most of their friends as well. And in October 2014, just two months before her death, the pair even went on an expensive holiday together, paid for by Carol. Carol took him for his 30th birthday to New York, lavished vast amounts of gifts, etc., on him, but she was quite happy to post all over his Facebook page. Carol and Ross form an unhealthy codependent relationship. They go on holiday together, they do activities together. It's a very, very close but overly fused relationship. And that starts to show us some disturbing signs regarding the control that Ross starts to emit over his mother. The family believed that Ross was happy to take his mother's money and gifts whilst contributing very little and it appeared he was now lying about work. He didn't have a job, and he'd led her to believe he had one. He was going to the house at working time in the morning and come home after work at night, claiming to have a job, and stealing her own money to sort of support the illusion of having a job just sums him up. Despite Ross's best endeavors to drive them apart, Lorraine and Carol were making small steps towards reconciliation, thanks to the news that Lorraine was expecting her first child. Lorraine told us straight away that she was pregnant. She was one of the first people she told. We had arranged to meet a few times, but she said she couldn't meet me or Lexi was there. It was just a no for me. I just really didn't want him around me. But it was clear that Carol was keen to have a relationship with her newborn grandson. I opened the front door and there was a parcel sitting from my mum for my little one. She had hand-knitted them cardigans because she was great at knitting. Suddenly, this beautiful wee boy had arrived. Carl wanted to see him. I know she wanted to see him. She never got to see him. I was but paid to that. Coming up. Ross is caught on camera. He actually starts to use Carol's money. He uses her cards to pay for things. There was CCTV of him going backwards and forwards to the caravan. He went with cleaning products. After isolating his mother, Carol, from the rest of her family, Ross Taggart had callously murdered her in the early hours of the 22nd of December 2014. He had now lied to the police and Sister Lorraine that Carol had gone missing. But would they uncover the truth about Carol's disappearance? And what drove Ross to such a despicable act? After receiving the phone call from Ross about her mum's disappearance, Daughter Lorraine was frantic with worry. I started phoning her every 10 minutes, her mobile. I was going out my mind. And in all of this, I was just a new mum. It was awful. I just wanted her home. And Lorraine says, no, Ross, she'll deal with everything for the police and that. I says, that's your mum. Phone the police now. You're entitled to know what's going on here. And we asked the police to keep us informed independently of Ross. Because, frankly, I would never believe anything he's saying because he was just a proven liar. The police informed Lorraine that calling her mother's mobile was futile, as they had had Carol's phone in their possession. But all this time, Ross had told us that Carol had taken her phone with her. And at that point, I knew something was wrong, because her phone was always in her hand. Ross, meanwhile, had been experiencing a taste of the high life. CCTV footage from the very same day he murdered his own mother shows him in Edinburgh, where he enjoyed cocktails, a meal, and a trip to the cinema, all paid for using Carol's credit card. 
he's constantly thinking about his own needs. He's not really considerate of the future consequences of his actions. Everything is about him in the here and now. Ross was caught on camera on several occasions using his mum's card, and perhaps even more shockingly, in a pawnbroker's attempting to sell a ring belonging to Carol and succeeding in selling a bangle of hers worth £100. Ross's behaviour showed little concern for what he had done or by the prospect that he could be found out. The net, however, was closing in. Christmas night, they found our car. The handbag in it, in a street in Dunfermline. And at that point, I looked at my dad and said, Mum's dead. It broke Lorraine. She just collapsed. We then realised that the police were looking for a body. The car was now a crucial piece of evidence, and one thing that became apparent was that Carol couldn't have been its last driver. Ross is six foot four, and Carol was five foot six, and Carol couldn't have reached the pedals where the seat position was. The police stepped up their investigation, and they had one clear suspect in mind. The question was asked to me, Stephen, and my dad, and it was, do you think Ross could harm your mum? And the answer we gave straight away was yes. He's told us that he was a suspect. We're just tracing his moves and we want to see what his next moves are. Um, they took the house off him at one point so they could go through it with a fine tooth comb. But on social media, at least, Ross was still keeping up the pretense of being a doting son. He was sharing with a police missing post for his mum. He was taking all the sympathy from people. Oh, my mum's missing. People that, oh, I hope she's found. Oh, thanks, I'm going out of my mind. All in all, it was just a big game he was playing. The police searches were now ramping up a gear. They had searched her house, back garden, front garden. They had searched her caravan, and there was nothing. So then they opened up the horizons a little bit further. On the morning of the 11th of January 2015, three weeks after Carol had been reporting missing, a knock on the door brought the news the family were dreading. I opened it, and it was the police standing there. I knew straight away, you found her, haven't you? Yes. They had said, look, we found a body. And I asked, we are. They said it was underneath a caravan. You need to come and identify a body. Can you come tomorrow morning? We need to know if it's your mum or not. I said, of course it's my mum. We walked into the kitchen and my dad was standing and I just collapsed in a heap. I knew it was her. I had a feeling. I knew she was gone. The body of a woman had been found in a void underneath a caravan, just two doors down from Carol's caravan in Kinghorn, just 13 miles from her home. Now Lorraine had to identify her mother, but when she got to the mortuary, there was a problem. I wasn't allowed to identify her body because she was too far gone because it had left her outside too long. And she was badly bruised and stuff, so they didn't want to show me that. So I got a tattoo on her, her wrist, and the tattoo was it, mine and her favourite colour, purple. And the leaves were green. The tattoo was grey. Just, just this, it looked so frail. And they just looked at me and said, look, you need to say yes. We need to hear it verbally. And my dad's staring at me and I could see him break in. He's trying to be strong for me. And I just said yes, and I had to get out of the room. Because at that point, then I knew she was gone. I can't never see her again. Because of him. The fact that Ross made us do that, I'll never forgive him for that. Lorraine, seen her own mum, no. Carol had been subjected to a significant level of violence prior to her death, with the ultimate cause being compression of the neck. Her body had been found wrapped in linen, which police discovered was from the house she and Ross shared and the caravan she owned and tied together with twine from Ross's bedroom. CCTV footage from the caravan park 
filmed the day after Ross reported his mum missing, proved that he had visited the site. There was CCTV of him going backwards and forwards to the caravan. He went with cleaning products. We had CCTV footage of him walking at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning to the caravan site. Ross is under no illusion that the police are going to look for his mother in all the places they would expect her to potentially go. And one of those places is indeed the caravan. Knowing that, he goes there and he cleans it from top to bottom because he wants to try to ensure that there will be no incriminating evidence there. He had tried to get away with it, but the evidence was so strong. He had her blood on her shoe, the shoes that he got bought for his 30th birthday when he went to New York. I can't ever forgive for what he's done. He dumped her outside like she was a bit rubbish and left her in freezing cold. Why would you kill your mum? Ross had failed to cover his tracks and was arrested for his mother's murder. Still pleading his innocence, he was set to stand trial, but it would be ten months before the court case, where the full extent of his lies and deception was set to be revealed. I wanted to know what I'd done to my mum, how he had done it, why he had done it. No matter how painful it was, I was going to be there and I would deal with it. And so was my dad and Stephen every day. Watching him walking into that courtroom, he couldn't even look. He just went in, sat, and just head forward the whole time. Not a single tear, nothing. He just stood there, snake eyes, staring. This was just the start of a harrowing trial for Carol's family as details emerged of her final moments. Yeah, I battered her in the house and put her in the boot of the car and drove her to the caravan. Inside the caravan, she started to move. He's went on top of her and he's broke her neck. You have two bones like this and he snapped one. And that's how he killed her. The fact that he moves her wrapped up in a rug when she's alive, in pain, that suggests he has absolutely no care for who she is at all. All he wants to do is to protect his own well-being and probably his own financial security as well. Equally as shocking were Ross's movements later that same day. Not only were the court informed of his night out in Edinburgh, paid for with his mother's credit card, but prior to that, only hours after killing his mother, Ross met with a young woman. Ross had disposed of the body, come back home, tidied up, went to his bed, got up and arranged to meet a girl on an internet dating site, and he met her at three o'clock that day. The idea of wanting to have sex after you've committed the murder of your mother is as far away from an expected reaction as you could imagine. Further damning evidence came from the fact that this girl's address was programmed into the sat-nav found in Carol's car, which gave even more proof that Ross had been the last one to drive it, and not his mother, as he'd claimed when he reported her disappearance. The police also uncovered that Ross had been stealing from his mum before her death, and this had led them to theorise that money could have been the motive behind the killing. We've guessed that she's confronted him about money or the likes. She's maybe caught him stealing. My mum was really clever with money. He just kept taking. Right to the end, Ross denied any wrongdoing. He took to the stand and still never admitted it. Stood there. But I asked, did you kill your mum? No. No. It took the jury just one hour to find Ross guilty of Carol's murder. They've sentenced him to life and he has an 18-year tariff, which means he's no eligible for parole in any shape or form until he serves at least 18 years. But he will still be younger than his mum was when he gets out, which is wrong, in my opinion. There was still one final blow for the family to deal with. Carol's will set out that Ross was to be both the main benefactor and the sole executor of his mother's will. And while Scottish law does prevent murderers from inheriting the estates of their victims, astonishingly, it does not prevent them from acting as executors, which put Ross in charge of Carol's assets worth half a million pounds. Even though he's been sentenced to murdering his own mother, he can still somehow manage his mum's final wishes. It's sick. Although Ross cannot inherit any of his mother's fortune, he can reduce the value of the estate. And one of the ways in which he's doing this is letting the value of Carol's home plummet by refusing to let anyone in to maintain it. We have this mausoleum of a house sitting there. It looks horrendous. While he sits in a prison cell, 
dictating what's happening. <laughs> Why? Ross is still the puppeteer. He managed to control his mother for years. He managed to exploit her. And now he has the power to exploit Sean and Lorraine. And every time he prevents them entering his mother's house, every time he prevents the grandchildren inheriting what's rightly theirs, he controls them. So still, he remains a malevolent and manipulative force from the inside. I wanted to go into that house and sit on her bed and grieve my mum. I wanted to be able to smell her, say goodbye, sort her house, do the last little thing I could do for her, sail it on and hopefully a beautiful family moves in and are happy. That's what I wished for. Lorraine says that she's been allowed into her mother's house, albeit only for an hour, as stipulated by Ross and accompanied by his lawyer. Sadly, it didn't offer the closure Lorraine had hoped for, as Carol's once pristine home is now infested with mice. This visit has spurred Lorraine on in her campaign to close the legal loophole that allows a killer to remain an executor of their victim's estate. And after gathering signatures in an online petition, she is now set to meet the Scottish government.